Uh, comrades and friends, welcome to the webinar to celebrate the 110th birth anniversary of Comrade Kim Il-sung. The song you just heard was a tribute to Kim Il-sung. Uh, it is said that, that uh, it is the second most popular song in Korea next to the national anthem of the PRK. So friends, um, through this webinar, we call for international solidarity for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Korean people in their struggle against uh, US imperialist aggression and in their mainly self-reliant efforts in building socialism. As we all know, the DPRK is one of the countries that has been under constant attack from US imperialism and its uh, uh, vassals in Europe and in other continents. Um, US imperialism considers as its enemy, any country, any government that asserts national sovereignty, but it reserves its most vicious attacks against countries, peoples, public, publicly declare their adherence to the socialist cause. Um, the DPRK, uh, was put uh, together with Iran in Iraq by George W. Bush in the so-called um, um, axis of evil. But we know pretty well which is the most evil imperialist power in the world today. Um, for today's webinar, we have uh, two excellent speakers. Uh, Professor Jose Maria Sison, uh, he is the chairperson emeritus of the International League of People Struggle. And our second speaker is Ireland Korea Friendship Association. Um, so after the speakers, we shall have a uh, question and answer portion. So as we go along, you should be preparing your questions already for our two speakers. So we use our time uh, efficiently. So now um, we give the floor to our first speaker, Professor Jose Maria Sison. Uh, he will speak on the outstanding contributions of comrade Kim Il-sung to the struggle of the peoples of the world for national liberation, democracy, and socialism, and also his original contributions to Marxism-Leninism in the era of imperialism and the world proletarian revolution. So now may we have the uh, video recording of Professor Wilson. Dear comrades and friends, as chairperson emeritus of the International League of People's Struggle, I convey my warmest greetings of solidarity to the people of Korea and other countries of the world who are inspired by the revolutionary ideas and feats of the great Korean leader Kim Il-sung in the struggle for national liberation, democracy, and socialism, and are celebrating his 110th birth anniversary as the day of the sun, the everlasting source of revolutionary wisdom, energy, and militancy. I feel highly honored and elated to participate in this webinar as part of the worldwide celebration to pay the highest respects and honor to the memory of Comrade Kim Il-sung. For the first time, I recall publicly the time when I met him and conversed with him for a whole day in 1987, 
I had just been released from the prison of the Marcos fascist dictatorship when in the course of my world tour I visited the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and was received as a special guest of Comrade Kim Il-sung. We discussed the situation in our respective countries and the pertinent events and issues about the world. We considered the revolutionary prospects. We agreed on the need for strengthening the fraternal bonds of the Korean and Filipino peoples and their revolutionary forces, the solidarity of worldwide anti-imperialist and democratic struggles and proletarian internationalism. In the course of my visit to DPRK, my admiration for Comrade Kim Il-sung became higher than ever before. I learned more about his brilliant application of Marxism-Leninism on the history and concrete circumstances of Korea. I recognized the great victories that he had achieved with his authorship of the Juche idea of the people being the self-reliant master and motive force of the revolution and the Songun idea of waging armed struggle to liberate the people from oppression and exploitation by imperialism and reaction. Since my youth, when the U.S. launched a war of aggression against Korea, I had taken notice of Comrade Kim Il-sung as the principal leader of the Korean Revolution. In his 30s, he had been able to defeat Japanese imperialism, and in his 40s, he was able to defeat U.S. imperialism. As a result of his resolute and creative leadership of the struggle of the toiling masses of workers and peasants against imperialism and feudalism, he was able to carry out socialist revolution and construction and turn DPRK into a bulwark of national independence, socialism, and the world proletarian revolution. Comrade Kim Il-sung was fortunate to have been born to a patriotic family with revolutionary anti-imperialist tradition from his great-grandparents to his parents. Thus, even as a teenager, he became an activist in the Down with Imperialism Union and soon became an outstanding cater by training a new generation of communists and by awakening and organizing the masses. In Eastern Manchuria, he led the struggle against the Japanese imperialists and Chinese warlords and worked for the unity of anti-Japanese forces. In the course of the struggle, he was able to create the Ju Chien Song ideas. He was able to develop and spread these among his Korean compatriots as he developed the first party organization, the Society uh, for Rallying Comrades, and the embryonic units of the Korean Revolutionary Army for the anti Japanese armed struggle. At the Ming Yue Gao meeting in 1931, he proposed the strategic policy of waging armed struggle, mainly in the form of guerrilla warfare. He founded the anti-Japanese People's Guerrilla Army. He began to apply the Songun-based concept of leadership and established guerrilla bases along the Tungman River. He established the People's Revolutionary Government and introduced democratic reforms. He expanded the armed struggle towards Korea. He built party organizations and expanded the mass organizations to support the armed struggle. An all-people defense system was developed in the guerrilla zones and the battles in, in their defense were intensified. Having accumulated arms, he reorganized the anti-Japanese People's Guerrilla Army into the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. He also established a party committee of uh, uh, the Korean uh, People's Revolutionary Army and stepped up political and military activities, ever determined to advance the Korean Revolution in accordance with the Juche idea, he dissolved the guerrilla zones and spread the armed struggle over wide areas. At the same time, he strengthened solidarity relations with the international revolutionary forces and the anti-imperialist Allied Front. At the Nan Ho Tao meeting of 1936, Comrade Kim Il-sung proposed a strategic policy of developing the armed struggle 
on a nationwide scale in Korea in the anti-Japanese National Liberation Movement. He consolidated the main force unit of the KPRA and formed the Association for the Restoration of the Fatherland. He directed the building of the Mount Paek II base with Paek Tusan secret camp at the center and more secret bases deep into Korea. He expanded the party and ARF organizations on a nationwide scale. After building the mass base on favorable terrain, he launched operations by large forces as in the historic Battle of Pochobo in order to inspire the Korean people to resist. Military and political activities were intensified to take advantage of the uh, Sino-Japanese War and prepare for an all-people resistance. He defined the task for continuous advance of the anti-Japanese national liberation struggle. The KPRA valiantly moved into the Musan area and strategic bases for the revolution in the northeastern area of Mount Paiktu. Large units circling operations and intense dispersed actions on a wide scale weakened and damaged seriously the strength of the enemy. At the Shao Hayar Baling meeting of 1940, Comrade Kim Il-sung set forth the strategic policy of preparing the national liberation of Korea. Under his direction, he deployed the KPRA for small unit offensives and intensified military and political training of more KPRA units. Preparations were completed for founding the party and developing the ARF movement the preparatory work for all people resistance in the final campaign against Japan was also accomplished. The Allied Front of the Armed Forces of Korea, China and the Soviet Union and the International Allied Forces went into high gear. The KPRA carried out courageously and victoriously its operations in the final offensive against Japan and fulfilled the cause of national liberation. The historic victory of the Korean people's anti-Japanese armed struggle vindicated and upheld Comrade Kim Il-sung's ideas of Chu Chen and song Un, which have been drawn from the revolutionary tradition of the Korean people. Comrade Kim Il-sung put forward the line of building a new Korea and the three major tasks for building a party, state and army and triumphant return. He realized the cause of party founding and upholding and implementing the political and organizational lines of the party. He rallied and mobilized the broad masses of the people around the party. He established the Provisional People's Committee of North Korea, carried out democratic reforms and developed democratic education and culture. He directed the preparations for the founding of the regular revolutionary armed forces. He called for struggle against the U.S. imperialist occupation of South Korea and their moves to divide the Korean nation. He founded uh, the Workers' Party as a mass party of the working people. He called for and carried out a general ideological mobilization movement for nation building and emulation drive for increased production an anti-literacy campaign. Comrade Kim Il-sung set forth the task for the early stage of the period of transition to socialism and the People's Committee of North Korea in 1947. He put forward the line of building an independent national economy and the rehabilitation and development of the national economy. He developed the Korean People's Revolutionary Army into the Korean People's Army and built up the military strength of North Korea. He laid the ground and prepared for the socialist transformation of the relationship production. He convened the Second Congress of the Workers' Party of North Korea and effected the qualitative consolidation of the party. He realized the unity of the entire nation and founded the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. He supported the Chinese people in their revolutionary struggle and solidarity with the international democratic forces. And he rallied the patriotic forces for national reunification and a plan for peaceful 
reunification. Comrade Kim Il-sung led the war of national liberation against the U.S. war of aggression and liberated the southern half of Korea by a decisive counteroffensive. U.S. imperialism persisted in its war of aggression, bombed communities, and massacred millions of the civilian population. Under the leadership of Comrade Kim Il-sung, the people overcame grave difficulties. Revolutionary discipline was tightened and the rear was rearranged. The KPA carried out active positional defense warfare. The party ranks expanded and the people's government enhanced its role and functions. Wartime production was stepped up and preparations were made for post-war rehabilitation. The KPA was strengthened in a qualitative, qualitative way under the guidance of duty-oriented war theory and tactics. It fought the U.S. aggression to a standstill, frustrated it, and became totally discredited with its barbarities rejected by the people of the world. The party raised higher its ideological, political, and organizational capabilities as the people aimed for final victory in the war. Comrade Kim Il-sung put forward the basic line for post-war economic construction and a struggle for a reconstruction of the national economy. He set forth the strategic task of army building after the war and the development of the KPA into the party's army loyal to its leadership. He published the April Thesis and led the struggle to step up the socialist revolution to the full and established a people-centered socialist system. He combated and overcame flunkyism and dogmatism and further promoted the Juche orientation after the war. He led the struggle to arm party members and other working people with socialist ideology and to defend and carry forward the revolutionary traditions of the people. He convened the Third Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea and led the struggle for the party's unity and against counter-revolution. He inspired the great revolutionary upsurge in socialist construction, the Cholima movement and its, its development. He initiated fresh changes in party work and promoted the Chongsanri spirit and Chongsanri method. He pursued the policy of independent and peaceful reunification of the country and supported the movement of Korean residents in Japan. He encouraged and supported activities against imperialism and for the unity and solidarity of the socialist countries. Comrade Kim Il-sung convened the Fourth Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea and set forth the task for the all-round construction of socialism. He built a new socialist economic management system and pursued a strategic policy of simultaneously carrying on economic construction and defense building and strengthening self-defense capabilities. He issued his thesis on the socialist rural question in DPRK and led the struggle to implement them. His efforts improved the activities of the working people's organizations and enhanced the officials' loyalty to the party, the working class, and the people were resoundingly successful. He led the conference of the WPK and the struggle to establish the party's monolithic ideological system and transform the whole of society along revolutionary and working class lines. The plan for socialist industrialization was fulfilled. The movement of Koreans in Japan and international solidarity with the world revolutionary forces made new and greater achievements. Comrade Kim Il-sung convened the fifth Congress of the party and set forth the task of vigorously pushing ahead with the ideological, technological, and cultural revolutions. He defined the three major tasks of the technological revolution and promulgated the socialist constitution. He developed further the Juche idea in a comprehensive way. He solved the problem of the continuity of the revolutionary cause. He made a profound development of the three revolutions and struggle for grand socialist construction. He approved Comrade Kim Jong-il's leadership system in the KPA 
and strengthen its fighting efficiency. He further consolidated the people's government and put the national economy on a duty-oriented, modern and scientific footing. He put forward his thesis on socialist education and struggle for development of socialist culture. He was ever desirous of and concerned with the fulfillment of the three principles and five-point policy for national reunification. He was consistently for consolidating unity with the peoples of the world who championed national independence. Comrade Kim il -sung convened the Sixth Congress of the party and defined the modeling of the Korean society on the Yuchi idea as the general task of the revolution. He led the general advance for implementing the decisions of the Sixth Party Congress and generating the speed of development in the 1980s. He reinvigorated uh, the KPA politically, ideologically, militarily, and technically, and established Kim Jong-il's overall leadership system in the KPA. He further developed the WPK into a duty-oriented revolutionary party. He defended and implemented the principles of socialist economic management and laid the solid material and technical foundations for socialism. He improved the people's material and cultural life. He promoted innovation in scientific and technological research and education. He continued realizing the proposal for strengthening the DPRK and he continued to advocate and work for the cause of national independence in global affairs. Comrade Kim Il-sung upheld the fundamental principles and fighting tasks for defending and advancing the cause of socialism in the face of the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, and the overweening arrogance of imperialism. He consolidated the socialist ideological position and added luster to socialist culture and the national cultural heritage of the Korean people. He built up the defense capabilities of the DPRK and frustrated the nuclear arrogance of the U.S. imperialists. He pushed forward with ever greater vigor the socialist economic construction in accordance with the changed situation and the developing revolution. He was more than ever dedicated to the cause of national reunification by dint of the great unity of the entire Korean people. He was for revitalizing the socialist movement and building a free, peaceful, and prosperous new world. Comrade Kim Il-sung's beloved successors, comrades Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, the entire Korean people, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the Korean Workers' Party, the Korean People's Army, and all Korean revolutionary forces have acclaimed him as the great leader of the Korean Revolution, as the author of the Juche idea and Songun idea, as founder of Socialist Korea and eternal president of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. We join them in acclaiming and celebrating the great revolutionary legacy of Comrade Kim Il-sung. We have drawn guidance and inspiration from his adherence to Marxism-Leninism, his own original contributions to Marxist-Leninist theory and practice, his revolutionary example of arduous struggle and self-sacrifice, and his great feats and victories in fighting Japanese imperialism, and then U.S. imperialism, and in realizing the anti-imperialist, anti-feudal democratic revolution, and consequently socialist revolution and construction. We must continue to study and learn from the revolutionary teachings and achievements of Comrade Kim Il-sung. His legacy is highly significant and relevant today and in the future. It belongs to the entire proletariat and people of the world. We owe to Comrade Kim Il-sung that the DPRK, the Korean people, and all the revolutionary forces continue in social, economic, cultural, political, military, and diplomatic terms as a strong bulwark of the working class 
an entire people of the world in their just struggle for national independence, democracy, and socialism. The crisis of the world capitalist system is rapidly worsening. U.S. imperialism is failing to stop its strategic decline. The inter-imperialist contradictions are intensifying. So are other major contradictions, such as those between monopoly, capital, and labor, between the imperialist powers and the oppressed peoples and nations, and between the imperialist powers and the countries assertive of national independence and their socialist programs and aspirations. The anti-imperialist and democratic struggles of the people of the world are spreading and are bound to intensify in the current decade and thereafter. We are in transition to a new resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. We are happy and thankful that the revolutionary legacy of Comrade Kim Il-sung continues to be a major factor in ensuring the advance of the revolution under the leadership of the proletarian. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Sison, for that excellent presentation. Uh, now we shall have uh, our second speaker. Uh, she's chairperson of the Ireland-Korea Friendship Association. In, in the course of her uh, solidarity work, she has uh, visited Korea several times. So she will uh, be able to give us some very interesting stories of her trips to the DPRK. Uh, her topic is um, the current challenges that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Korean people face uh, uh, in the struggle against the constant and continuing attacks of US imperialism, and also in their uh, mainly self-reliant efforts in building a socialist society. Dear comrades and friends, as you all probably know, the DPRK's borders have been sealed for over two years now, since early 2020, due to COVID pandemic. DPRK was one of the first countries to close its borders because of it, which also has led to almost complete stoppage of international trade, even with its closest neighbors, such as China and Russia. The preventive measures taken by the country's leadership have been a huge success, with not a single COVID infection in the country so far, as reported to the World Health Organization on a regular basis. There were a couple of COVID scares, but mass testing and short lockdowns were implemented immediately with a great efficiency and organizational skills so typical for the Korean people, and no infections were detected as a result. We all know that COVID pandemic, as well as lockdowns and other COVID prevention aimed measures, have imposed a huge toll on all the countries of the world, both in terms of mortality, physical well being, economic misery, and in terms of grave mental health strains. We all have experienced it in various degrees in our own lives. Many of us still continue to experience it as of today. The damage done by the pandemic itself and by the relevant measures to limit the spreading of COVID has left deep scars in the heart and soul of mankind as a whole, with economic consequences of it far from over and perhaps still not even fully estimated. The rise of poverty, inequality, discrimination, hunger, political and military conflicts in the world is already unfolding in front of our eyes, as well as the reshaping and the remapping of the world's political and economic alliances. But the current crisis also brings new possibilities of changing our world for a better one, for the rise of mass movements of the working masses, for future socialist revolutions around the world, for breaking of imperialist chains that have suffocated the majority of the world's population for too long. The crisis of this scale will throw in the dustbin of history, the rose tinted glasses that many people, especially those in rich imperialist countries, choose to wear over the years, blinded by the capitalist mass media, by capitalist education and propaganda systems into believing that anyone 
has so-called equal chances for personal success within the frames of capitalist system, and that this system guarantees so-called freedom and so-called human rights. What we as communists have known about capitalism and socialism for many years is now becoming obvious to more and more people whose illusions about capitalist society are being shattered by harsh reality of it. Well, it might seem to some of you that I started off my contribution far from its announced topic, but it's not the case. All of this could not be more relevant to it. In order to understand how the DPRK is coping with the current crisis, we have to understand that the socialist society of the DPRK is based on completely different principles than our own capitalist societies, and that the Korean people in the DPRK are being brought up from a very young age in a completely different set of values than those imposed on us in our capitalist countries. It's quite a big step, perhaps, to come to this understanding when everything you hear around you about the DPRK is completely negative during your whole life. For me, it was easier to make this step toward understanding because of my own experience of living in a socialist country, even though my country was quite different culturally from the DPRK. And also because I had the opportunity to familiarize myself with ideas of Korean socialism, with Chuche ideas, when I was a teenager in Soviet Union through having a subscription for a DPRK magazine in the Russian language. Nevertheless, by the time when I got my first opportunity to visit Pyongyang, many years have passed. Soviet Union, my motherland, no longer existed. And I had become quite cynical due to many years lived under capitalist system in the West. By that time, I already thought that those magazines from my youth were probably to a large extent just propaganda, like some materials of the USSR from the 1970s and 1980s. And I couldn't possibly be more wrong. I came to see Korea first time, perhaps due to a nostalgic feeling about the way of life which we as Soviet people have lost. Somewhere deep in my heart, I was of course hoping that I would finally see a place that can help me to keep my socialist dream alive. I'll bet this hope was very vague. But the reality of the DPRK far exceeded my expectations. I felt it almost immediately in the atmosphere of the place, in the way people looked happy, relaxed, optimistic, and in a short, sort of hard to describe harmony with each other, caring for each other with no one left behind. Such atmosphere can be feigned or arranged for visitors as some Western journalists usually try to claim. You can feel it when it's genuine. Not to mention that to my big surprise, Korea was just as beautiful as on the photos from that old magazine in the 1970s and frankly speaking, even more beautiful. Because of my deep cynicism developed after experience of capitalist life, I still kept asking myself for a few next years, every time before my next visit, could I perhaps be mistaken? As most people traumatized by the loss of our socialist motherland, I kept looking for any possible signs of capitalism creeping into this harmonious and happy place, for any signs of decay of people's spirits, not because I'd be keen to see it the way Western journalists would be, but quite the opposite, because I was so afraid that I might see it, but I was never disappointed. Eventually, as I learned to trust the people around me, and it's a hard task, again, after life under capitalism, I was so lucky to meet some comrades who have helped me to tune in, to understand the Korean society and mentality better and deeper. With them, I felt so at ease that if I didn't understand something, I felt confident enough to ask questions about it. And it helped me greatly to develop a closer feeling and a deeper understanding of many cultural differences that some other foreigners perhaps just didn't bother to understand. This was such a magnificent feeling of spiritual unity and inner connection that I have never experienced before in my life. With time, I started seeing Korean comrades as my extended family my brothers and sisters, even though, of course, it is a process and surely there are still many things I need to learn about. Living in harmony with each other and being happy, as one popular Korean song says, we do not envy anyone in the world. Of course, it doesn't mean that life is just all easy and cozy and rosy. 
DPRK has had many obstacles and difficulties throughout its history, both from the imperialist aggression and stifling sanctions and natural disasters, as well as certain limitations of natural resources. For example, DPRK territory is very mountainous and there isn't much land suitable for agriculture. For decennia, we hear from all sorts of experts that the DPRK is about to collapse in the very near future. But this small and proud country, a hedgehog that defied the tiger is often being used as its symbol, not only continues to live, but develops successfully and even thrives as it was thriving astonishingly in the last several years before the pandemic struck. Korean people have shown to the world that they are capable of immeasurable miracles from the speed of construction to scientific developments, to defense technology, to education, in any task that the Workers' Party of Korea has set for them. The secret of these miracles is in what Korean newspaper Nodong Sin Moon defines as single-minded unity of party and masses is Workers' Party of Korea's mode of existence. For many people who lived in the USSR in the 1970s and 1980s, such unity of party and people was just an empty slogan. The difference with the DPRK is that it isn't an empty slogan there. It virtually is the mode of existence. You see, material comforts alone and Besides, those comforts are not for everyone, like it is in the capitalist countries. Uh, they do not define the happiness and do not create miracles. It's the feeling of unity, knowing that you have true friends who will not abandon you in any hardships, who will be there for you when you need them, just as you will be there for them. And that the party is really there to serve the people and to develop the way for the people's prosperous and happy future. That's what makes a difference. In Soviet Union, there were many party bureaucrats who didn't really care about anything but their own position. In the DPRK, party educates and re-educates its members if needed. And the officials also take part in manual work together with the masses. What's also inspiring is the access of the whole population, without exception, to opportunities for intellectual and cultural development, something most working masses are deprived of in the capitalist world. I, again, with my sad experience of what had happened to Eastern European socialism, have once expressed to my Korean comrade my fear of what might happen with Korean reunification, pointing out how in Germany, the capitalist West had swallowed the socialist East. I could see that my comrade became a bit angry with me for making such comparison, but he never raised his voice. He simply said, have you ever thought about it? Why in South Korea, any materials from our country are strictly prohibited, even songs, even just music without words. People there get imprisoned for accessing any DPRK website. Have you ever thought what is the reason for this? Perhaps it's because if they would know the truth about our country, they would actually overthrow the capitalist system themselves. And I agreed with him after what I have seen in South Korea during my few visits there, not nice cafes, not K-pop music, but how the workers in South Korea have been treated. In the DPRK, nobody starves, nobody lives in the streets, nobody gets rejected for medical treatment or education because of lack of money, because those facilities are free. Housing is virtually free. People get new apartments or houses in the countryside completely free of charge from the state, even furnished. So is medical treatment and education. There is now a compulsory 12-year education system in place in the country with pupils and students even getting their books and their uniforms for free. After a school day in the afternoon, all kids in the country have access to various extracurricular activities of their own choice, be it sports, dancing, music, science, arts, anything. Koreans say that kids are the true kings of the country. My own children had an opportunity to experience this during their stay in Sundavon International Children's Camp near Wonsan some years ago, where they made friends not just with Korean kids, but also with children from China, Russia, Vietnam, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Tanzania. With regards to US military threat to the PRK, I must say that members of our friendship association and other foreign friendship associations have never felt more protected anywhere in the world than in the DPRK. Our relatives 
in our home countries probably were worried more about us than ourselves during our visits. Even at the height of Donald Trump's threats of almost imminent attack in 2017, Pyongyang felt incredibly safe and peaceful. Of course, now, when the DPRK has developed and tested more modern defensive weapons system and continues to do so, it is becoming even safer. The Koreans have learned from tragic experiences of other countries, such as Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia. They won't let this happen to their beloved motherland. Western journalists don't realize how ridiculous they sound when they scream about the DPRK's threat to humanity. As I said to an Irish journalist once, it's a small country. It just wants to be left in peace and to develop peacefully. That's why it needs those weapons. He has been so brainwashed that he asked me in a serious tone, do you really think so? I just laughed then. When the pandemic struck, our hearts were immediately with the Korean people. We knew they were probably better equipped to get through it because of their silence, of their socialist system, their party leadership, and their previous experiences with epidemies of a smaller scale. But of course, none of us expected that it would develop to such proportions this time and that it would take so long. It was especially hurtful to think that the DPRK was doing so well economically just on the eve of the pandemic with new housing for the people, new cultural facilities, new developments in industry and agriculture unfolding virtually every day. It was painful to think that all these heroic efforts could be now wiped off because of the economic constraints. But the DPRK, under the leadership of the Workers' Party of Korea and its General Secretary, Comrade Kim Jong-un, stood up to this challenge and won. Yes, the times are still hard. The country is still in lockdown and the trade is still recovering. But the DPRK is standing strong, both through its wise policy of self-reliance and through the stoic spirits its people have been brought up with by the party. In times like this, wise and strong leadership with wholehearted dedication to the people and deep vision of the path towards the bright future is especially important. I think no other country in the world has such leadership at this point in history, only DPRK. The evidence of it, just have a look at the pages of some of the DPRK newspapers for the latest news. While the capitalist world is really in a deepening crisis of cost of living, of other economic woes, of grim military and political situation adding to the people's misery, this is what has been happening in the DPRK in the last few weeks alone. On March 29th this year, first workshop of officials and information field of the Workers' Party of Korea was held. It was titled On Eliminating Formalism and Bringing About a Fundamental Innovation in the Party's Ideological Work. The stress is on fundamental innovation in ideological work. On April the 3rd, Potong Riverside Terraced Residential District's construction was completed. This terraced residential district was built in a unique way uh, and it will have homes for working people, including labor innovation, innovators in various fields, persons of distinguished services, scientists, educators, and writers who devote themselves to the party and the state. It is a tradition in the DPRK to complete new residential districts providing people with modern housing towards important dates in country's history. 10 years ago, when the DPRK was celebrating the 100th anniversary of President Kim Il-sung, we were present at one of such ceremonies. Pyongyang since then has become a completely different looking city. On the 9th of April this year, a national art exhibition opened at the Korean Art Gallery. There were also a stamp show held, a cooking festival, a national photo exhibition, provincial exhibitions of construction equipment and tools. In the news, there were also articles stating that new achievements are recorded in growing hothouse vegetables and that from the new academic year, students of universities, colleges and schools in the DPRK will learn landscaping, ecological environment protection and recycling as new subjects. On the 11th of April, the 32nd April Spring Friendship Art Festival was opened to celebrate the 110th birth anniversary of President Kim Il-sung. This year it was in online mode because of the pandemic. 
It was opened with participation of countries, including China, Russia, Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, Belarus, Moldova, Hungary, Austria, France, and Ethiopia, and overseas Korean art groups. On the 12th of April, also national book exhibition was opened in Berke. On display, there were more than 20,000 publications of over 15,000 kinds, including works authored by President Kim Il-sung, by Chairman Kim Jong-il, and the respected comrade Kim Jong-un. Among the exhibits are also books explaining the party policies, literary books, and scientific and technical books, and all recently published ones. They were also on the show. On the 12th of April, an exhibition of technological innovation achievements by workers and trade union members across the country was opened under the sponsorship of the Central Committee of the General Federation of Trade Unions of Korea. The virtual exhibition was accessible in the internet throughout the country at any time. On the 12th of April, the same day, a dancing party of youth and students was held in Pyongyang. And also uh, an inauguration ceremony of Songhua Street was held. Uh, Korean Central News Agency reported about it. Songhua Street, built in the Eastern Gateway to Pyongyang under the unique architectural development plan of the party central committee and the plan for building 50,000 flats in Pyongyang set forth at the eighth Congress of the party is an outcome of the workers' parties of Korea long cherished desire to provide the people with more stable and civilized living conditions and successfully resolve the housing shortage of capital citizens. The soldiers and civilians involved in the project performed an eye-opening miracle of building the distinctive grand architectural group of 10,000 flats, including an 80-story skyscraper within a year by waging a strenuous onward campaign, the fierce 24 seven struggle, despite manifold challenges and trials. Comrade Kim Jong-un, General Secretary of the Workers' Party of Korea and President of the State Affairs of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was present at the opening ceremony and cut the red ribbon. The construction was completed through Army People Coordinated Operation. The housing construction in the Songsing and Songhua areas was a grand campaign of creation beyond imagination in terms of architectural style and content and scale of project, as it required completing in just one year of more than 160 blocks of skyscrapers and high-rising apartments, public buildings and service amenities, with a total floor space of 1 million and hundreds of thousands square meters in an area covering 56 hectares. The framework construction of the skyscraper was completed in 80 days to make a breakthrough in the grand construction project. The exterior wall plastering and tile setting estimated to take more than two months were completed in just one week. Soldier and civilian builders through busy with a 24 seven campaign gave sincere support to the units left behind. And they also sincerely helped farms nearby. Wives of officers helped their husbands and soldiers. Hundreds of households moved into cozy dwelling houses newly built all across the country too. Seeing all this, we are very confident that the DPRK will not only survive the current crisis, but will come out of it stronger than many other nations. We all have a lot to learn from the DPRK. Recently, even such big capitalist country as Russia had to admit that it needs to learn from the DPRK how to survive under sanctions. Well, there is a bitter irony in it because just a few years ago in 2017, the same Russia happily supported U.S. proposed sanctions against the DPRK in the United Nations Security Council, despite having the ability to, to veto them. It's of great importance for all countries under Western sanctions to build up a united front against this attack on their sovereignty from now on, and to provide support to each other. So the current worldwide crisis of the capitalist system is also providing the DPRK with new opportunities. But of course, the fundamental issue for those other nations is the need to get rid of what President Kim Il-sung has called flunkyism, an adulation for rich and powerful countries, a subservient attitude towards them. In his own words, worshiping others blindly. President Kim Il-sung said, I always tell our officials that if a man takes to flunkyism, he will become a fool. 
If a nation falls to flunkism, the country will be ruined. And if a party adopts flunkism, it will make a mess of the revolution and construction. He said that in his work on the three principles of national reunification in uh, May and November 1972. If Russia and other countries would have learned the wisdom of President Kimmelson's words in the past and would not look up to Western civilization or try to please the West and to blindly copy the capitalist way of life, but to develop our own socialist way throughout all the obstacles, we wouldn't have been in such a mess right now. When coming here, I've had a conversation on the bus with a young Latin American student who likes to travel. He asked me which city, in my opinion, is the most beautiful city in the world. And I immediately said Pinyan, not just because of its amazing architecture, but also because of its people, its resilient and staunch spirit. Because for me, Pinyan stands for the future of socialism on our planet, for assuring a meaningful life possible for everyone for making even the impossible possible. President Kim Il-sung's great contribution to the bright and just future for the whole mankind will always be immortal and unique. Thank you. Before we go to the uh, question and answer portion, we shall have an inter intermission number. sang, uh, and actually it was not just performed, but also written by comrades from Venezuela, from Venezuelan Solidarity Group with the DPRK, who had visited uh, uh, the DPRK 10 years ago when we were all celebrating the 100th anniversary of President Kim Il-sung, and there was a concert of uh, people who came to express their solidarity from different countries. So the comrade from Venezuela came with his own song. It's actually in Korean language, and it, um, it says such a, uh, you probably heard that he was saying uh, the name of President Kim Il-sung, also the name of uh, Kim Jong-il. It also speaks about the Chuche idea, uh, the Song Gun. And uh, he ends the song with Manse, which in Korean means Korea. So as you see, solidarity towards the PRK is really worldwide. We have uh, groups of solidarity in Europe, in America, in Asia. In, in, in both Americas, actually, in Latin America and in North America, in Australia, virtually everywhere in the world. And it's a great opportunity today for all of us, for people who uh, express their solidarity to Korean people uh, to meet and to celebrate this glorious occasion together.
we now proceed to the question and answer portion. But uh, before we go to that, um, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Rafael Mariano, who is the chairperson of the Philippines, Korea, Solidarity and Friendship Society. Um, the, the, this uh, Solidarity Society has uh, sent a message to uh, Kim Jong-un uh, in a celebration of the 110th birth anniversary of Comrade Kim Il-sung. And um, uh, Ka Paeng Mariano will uh, read the, the solidarity statement that they have sent. Our greetings of solidarity from Philippines, Korea, Solidarity and Friendship Society on the celebration of the 110th birth anniversary of President Kim Il-sung, April 8, 2022. Kim Il-sung, eternal son of humankind. On the 110th birth anniversary of the internal leader of the Korean people, President Kim Il-sung, 1912 to 1994, the Philippines Korea Solidarity and Friendship Society, PKSFS, joins the progressive peoples of the world in giving the highest praise and tribute to the eternal son of humankind who has devoted his whole life to his beloved country, Korea, and to the Korean people to achieve independence. The progressive peoples of the world are celebrating President Kim Il-sung's 110th birth anniversary at the time when Socialist Korea is showing to the whole world the strength of his beloved country's independence. He held strongly on the principle of independence all his life. President Kim Il-sung was not Korea's leader from 1948 until his death in 1994. He was the country's premier from 1948 to 1972, chairman of the Workers' Party of Korea from 1949 and president and head of state from 1972. He is a great leader of the Korean revolution who led his beloved country and people from the ashes of the Argos Revolutionary War for independence against US and Japanese imperialists and in building a country the Korean people are very proud of. It is indeed rare to find leaders like Kim Il-sung who was tested by leading the Korean peoples before during and in winning the Revolutionary War. In the long history of countries, there are many great men who left important lessons of their struggles to liberate their countries and achieve independence. However, it is very difficult to find someone who is a great leader who achieved immortal exploits by leading an arduous revolutionary war in his own country, like the Korean Revolution. Kim Il-sung is indeed a great revolutionary who liberated his country and people and built his country destroyed by U.S. and Japanese imperialists to access into a strong and independent Korea. President Kim Il-sung opened the way for a new life for the Korean people after the Revolutionary War for liberation of Korea. He worked hard for the reunification of his country. He was sad about the national sufferings of the Korean people due to the national division of Korea. He fully dedicated his life to the cause of national reunification until his death. He loved to visit the Korean people where they were working, be it in agricultural cooperatives as fishermen or doing other work for the people. He remained very close to the people and gave suggestions to improve their lives. For the respected President Kim Il-sung to reunify the country is the revolutionary duty and moral obligations of the party and the Korean people, a sacred national task that should be taken up by all generations. This must be pursued and fulfilled regardless of the obstacle along the way. The great leader, President Kim Il-sung, is known as the son of Korea and the Lord Star of National Reunification. He pioneered the cause of national reunification, which was brought about by the division of Korea by foreign forces at the end of the Second World War. The U.S. imperialist occupation of South Korea and the maneuvers of divisive forces in the country and outside against 
reunification continued, but President Kim Il-sung was firm with his line of reunification. President Kim Il-sung led the movement for reunification on his own initiative by strengthening the people in the northern half of the country into a bulwark for national reunification. He ensured their active support and encouragement to the South Korean people on their patriotic struggle for independence, democracy, and national reunification. The independent and peaceful reunification of Korea is the supreme task of the Korean nation. It should be a thorough national independence and a truly patriotic line for the development of the, of the country to be reunified and to ensure its prosperity. We, the Filipino people, will continue to strongly support and be in solidarity with the struggles of the Korean people for an independent and peaceful reunification of Korea. Long live the revolutionary legacy of President Kim Il-sung. Long live the struggle for an independent and peaceful reunification of Korea. U.S. imperialist out of Korea. Korea is one. Long live international solidarity. Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, message uh, from the Philippine Korea Solidarity and Friendship Society. Um, at this point, I would like to point out that uh, the sponsoring organizations for this webinar are the International League of People Struggle, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines International Office, and the Ireland-Korea Friendship Association. Uh, we shall now have the uh, question and answer portion. I would like to remind the participants that the, their question, they send their questions to the chat so that we can uh, hand them over to our speakers. Um, uh, well, to start the ball rolling, uh, one question uh, addressed to Professor Sison. Um, uh, is there a difference between uh, Kim Il-sung's Juche idea to Mao's uh, concept of self-reliance? There is no essential difference <clears throat> between Mao's concept of self-reliance and uh, Kim Il-sung's uh, concept of Juche. Um, the concept of Juche uh, refers to the people as the motive force of history. And it is very well capable of uh, 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 making revolution you know, uh, self-reliantly. Uh, the difference would lie in uh, the extraction of the principle from um, two different uh, uh, histories and um, um, a revolutionary process. Um, so uh, I refer to the history and circumstances of China and Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 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 the principle of self-reliance uh, as um, uh, developed by uh, Mao and Kim Il-sung has something to do with uh, uh, the law of contradiction, um, which uh, Marx and Engels and uh, their uh, uh, successors like Lenin and Stalin uh, would maintain. It, this law has something to do with uh, the status and changeability uh, of social conditions. No? Mm -hmm. And um, in the, um, uh, Mao's uh, present way, in, his, in Mao's present language, no? Um, uh, no matter how, how long and how much temperature uh, that you apply on a stone, uh, it will not mm. turn into a chick, no? <laughs> it, it has to be a chicken's, it has to be a hen's egg <laughs> that you, uh, upon which you apply the, the proper temperature in order to uh, produce the chick. And so um, this, uh, um, what can we draw from this statement? Um, changeability depends on, um, on um, 
uh, the potentiality there is in a given thing or in uh, a process. Um, Comrade Kebersong told me something significant. Uh, uh, getting aid from abroad is good. Huh? It can be for, it's better to have bigger aid uh, from uh, outside for a revolutionary movement. But uh, the aid can be, can be um, worse mm. uh, when you become dependent mm -hmm. on it. If, if uh, you may get any amount of aid, uh, from abroad, but you have the responsibility of, um, of uh, becoming more self-reliant. No? There is a kind of aid right, provided by the imperialists. No? Mm. It makes you dependent like drugs, you know, uh, and then you become weakened eh, by being <clears throat> dependent on external assistance. Um, you, must be, you must have the will and the way to make use of foreign assistance uh, in order to become more self-reliant and stronger. Otherwise, uh, uh, that external uh, uh, factor will damn you uh, if you become mm -hmm. dependent on it. No? So okay. I hope uh, self-reliance is uh, well explained. Um, any amount of aid from abroad is good, but uh, don't uh, turn it into a bad thing by becoming dependent on it. You must use it to be become uh, uh, more self-willing and uh, more uh, strong. Yeah? Mm. So. The question of uh, uh, reunification of the country. Um, in, in many of the dialogues between the government of the North and the South, this, this question is always one of the important topics for discussion. Um, from, from your uh, visits to the deeper arcade, um, how, how strong is the sentiment among the people both in both parts of the country for national reunification? Um, yes, naturally the feeling is very strong even though it's expressed in uh, each part of Korea in a different way because in the north, uh, people don't have to hide their aspiration for reunification. Uh, the whole nation basically uh, lives with that spirit of need for reunification. Um, the division of Korea is, is being seen as a national tragedy. In South Korea, the conditions are dif different. So even though people have the same feeling because Korean nation is one nation, the history goes back uh, thousands of years while the division is only uh, they are just uh, around 70, 70 years, just above 70 years. Uh, but in uh, South Korea, you cannot speak openly about it because there is still a national security law which was introduced uh, just uh, after the division of Korea. And that law prohibits to express any sort of sympathy towards the DPRK. Uh, to speak about reunification also falls under that scope. So people, uh, even when they express it openly, they have to do it in a very careful way. But of course, uh, the feeling, the desire for national reunification is very strong. And if you have a chance to get to know people better in South Korea and they open up to you, you can uh, have conversation about it and you can feel it too. And there are various movements uh, and uh, it also depends what stage, um, what stage of history is, uh, what's happening in South Korean political reality. For example, when there is more or less um, relatively progressive government, people can express it more freely. But when there is more conservative and more reactionary government, then it all shuts down. Uh, as I said already in my speech, people in South Korea are not allowed to access any sort of news uh, from the DPRK, any sort of materials, no films or anything like that. People in the West, we all been told about how in, in the North Korean the DPRK people cannot see South Korean movies and so on and so forth, but they never speak about what's happening in South Korea with relation to materials from the DPRK. Um, uh, but people in South Korea also have shown over the last several years, especially and previously too, that they can fight successfully for achieving a national democratic revolution. The uh, latest example of that is the so-called candle revolution when the people's mass movement overthrew uh, the regime of uh, Park Geun-hye who was imprisoned uh, after that. Uh, and they helped to uh, 
uh, achieve the presidency for uh, uh, Moon Jae-in. Uh, the conditions are very harsh in South Korea for anyone who fights for reunification. Of course, you all know that there is around 35,000 US troops still stationed in South Korea and uh, their presence is very evident on the whole atmosphere. You, you can feel that it's still a colonial society more or less. So uh, comrades in South Korea who are fighting for reunification of their country, for the national democratic revolution, which would be, I think, uh, a necessary condition for being able to throw out uh, the US army from the Korean Peninsula. Those uh, comrades are very brave and they're doing great work. And uh, we'd also try to express solidarity with them as much as possible. It's hard to predict when the reunification of Korea will happen, but it remains the number one national goal, of course. Um, this question is from Jeff uh, Busalt of the Belgian Korea Friendship Association, uh, addressed to Professor Sison. Uh, do you agree that the actual essential tasks and challenges of the Korean people are one, peace and expulsion of the US Army from the territory of Korea, two, democracy and national democratic revolution in South Korea, and three, reunification of Korea into one state? I agree uh, that uh, uh, the presence of the U.S. military forces in South Korea um, uh, are a block to or a um, uh, hindrance of the big obstacle um, uh, to the re peaceful reunification of uh, uh, Korea and the Korean people. Uh, the U.S. Army has to be expelled no? from the um, uh, from the territory of uh, South Korea. The, this army has been there since um, na the end of the Korean War. The armistice has run for how many years? Uh, 70, um, practically um, uh, 70 years. And then um, um, uh, South Korea has been treated as a frontline um, uh, area for the um, uh, for the so-called free world, no, uh, that is uh, masterminded by the by U.S. imperialism. So there has been some amount of uh, uh, bourgeois democratic reforms, uh, some amount of bourgeois land reform and uh, industrialization. But uh, Korea, South Korea is in need eh, uh, of further than democratization and um, um, uh, the national democratic revolution must be carried uh, uh, forward, no? So that the uh, proletariat can uh, assume class leadership over society. So um, there is uh, a lot of uh, revolutionary tasks to be carried out in uh, uh, South Korea. Um, the, it is uh, but just uh, that the Korean people reunite, no? uh, are reunified as a whole nation. No? Mm. And uh, uh, they will become a stronger force for uh, peace and development if uh, they gain um, complete freedom from the imperialist and uh, they're freed from the nuclear war from the from U.S. imperialism and uh, its allies. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Sison. Um, so we, we now wrap up. For many of us who are still uh, engaged in the life and death struggle for national liberation, democracy, and socialism, um, the discussions that uh, we had uh, with uh, Professor Sison and Irina Malenko, I think has, uh, they've given us uh, um, inspiration, both inspiration and stimulation to 
study further the examples of, uh, of uh, the struggles of the DPRK and also uh, Soviet Union to learn lessons from these struggles, um, both positive and negative for our own uh, revolutionary struggles. We, uh, she, she discussed uh, in her presentation from a very personal level and uh, having experienced life in the former Soviet Union and then uh, uh, visited uh, the DPRK uh, several times and felt uh, some kind of nostalgia. Um, so it shows also that uh, indeed um, another world is possible. Uh, under socialism, another world is really possible. Um, yeah, that, so we end this webinar uh, with the op that kind of optimism. And we would like to thank, of course, uh, the two speakers uh, for sharing us their knowledge. Um, and we also thank the sponsoring organizations and all the participants who join us in this webinar uh, to express our solidarity with the Korean people um, in their struggle against US imperialism and in their efforts to build a socialist society. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we would like to uh, finish uh, our program today with yet another Korean song. And just to tell you a few words about it, it's a group of uh, uh, four young men who play guitar and they sing. And they actually, they are actually, uh, it's a group of um, people who work for uh, DPRK, internal security ministry. So they're actually security officials, but they are great musicians and they even perform in Europe. I think, I think they had some concerts in Italy. And as you will see for yourself, I think they represent uh, the multifaceted development of personality under Korean socialism. So they are not just security personnel, they're also great, great singers. And the song that they sing is called, uh, Do We Still Live Like In Those Days? That's roughly translated. And that, uh, that means uh, people who refer to experience of the uh, heroic ancestors, people who were fighting for the liberation of the country. Do we still live like in those days? Do, are we still faithful to those ideals of the past, of the past struggle? And I think it would be uh, a good way to finish our program today. <laughs>
영원히 우리 살리라 깨달은 그 맹세 신당으로 지키도 그때 그날 소 